Hello, I'm Luis Serrano, the lead of developer relations at Cohere. Large language models have seen huge advancements lately, especially in applications such as text generation, semantic search, and others. In the center of these advancements is a key player, the transformer model. There are many properties of a transformer model, but the most important one is that it's able to carry the context of the text. This is something that has been a huge challenge for most NLP models in the past. In this video, I'm going to show you how transformer models work and what are those particular pieces that make them work so well. A transformer model is something that simply guesses the next word in a sentence. This is something you've seen before. For example, when you type a text message on your phone and you say, for example, hello, how are, the phone will suggest the next word. Here it suggests three options, you, your, and things. And the middle one is the highest one. How does this work? Well, in previous models, it works with a neural network. And how does a neural network work? Well, the input is all the words in the dictionary from the first one to the last one. And for any word that is there, we have a one and the words that are not there, we have a zero. These go into a neural network. And the basic idea is that the neural network would try to mimic what is seen previously on the data. So if it's data is many, many sentences, it tries to guess the next word coming after a few previous words. The output of the neural network is a bunch of probabilities or so a bunch of numbers that add to one and they are high for words that are likely to come after. So for example, here the highest numbers are in things, you and your, and that's why the model returns this word you. That is the suggestion or the prediction. Now there's a small problem and I don't know if you ever tried this, but you should try it. You keep pressing the key in the middle in your phone to see what text comes out and a bunch of nonsensical text comes out. Some sentences make sense. If you take a few words at a time, it does seem like it's saying sensible things. But if you read the whole thing, the whole thing makes no sense. And the reason is that these neural networks do not carry context. Transformer models, on the other hand, they do carry context. But at the end of the day, all they do is find the next word. So if you input hello, how, the transformer says are. Now you can input more complicated things, like for example, write a story. Then the transformer model won't come up with a story. It will only come up with the next word. The next word is once because most stories start with the word once. So now how do you continue writing the story? Well, now you input write a story once and it says upon. And then you input write a story once upon and it says ah. And then you continue building the story one word at a time. And that's how it creates those amazing stories or amazing responses that really sound like someone's talking to you. So how's that different from neural networks? Neural networks, you can input hello, how are, and it outputs the next word. And for transformer, you can also input something like tell me a story and it says once. So the difference between transformers and neural networks is number one, they are huge. They have tons and tons and tons of parameters. They are trained on lots and lots and lots of data. But the most important one is that they carry context. And I'm going to get to that in a bit. First, let's look at the architecture of them. If you've seen a neural network, and if you haven't, there are some resources in the comments that you can take a look. But a neural network has a bunch of feed forward layers where text is turned into numbers. These numbers are processed in one way, then they're processed again, processed again, until a number comes out or a series of numbers. That's how they work. Well, a transformer is like a neural network, but it has a bunch of enhancements. This is how the architecture of a transformer looks. And as you can see, there are some feed forward layers. They're just padded with a bunch of other things like attention, positional encoding, etc., etc. So in this video, I'm going to show you all of these pieces of the architecture, and you're going to see that they're actually pretty simple. So on the bottom left, you see the input, which is write a story. And on the right, you see the output, which is once. So let's first look at this step, tokenization. This one is pretty simple. This one simply takes the words and turns them into pre-existing tokens. So there is a token for every word and also for every punctuation sign, etc. This is just a pre-processing step. Now let's get to the embedding. Now you have seen previously a video about embeddings and if you haven't, the link is in the comments. But embeddings really turn text into numbers. So for example here, write goes into this bunch of numbers that are could be thousands. Add goes into a bunch of other numbers. A story, 
and then period and the point of embeddings as you can see in the other video and the other post is that similar words go to similar numbers and there's a lot more properties but basically an embedding is a really really good way to turn words into lots of numbers the next step is called positional encoding and what positional encoding does is it gives order to the words in a sentence for example the following two sentences i'm not sad i'm happy and i'm not happy i'm sad mean something completely different they're opposites however when you turn every word into a vector into a series of numbers you get the same numbers because the vectors are the exact same thing so positional encoding simply breaks that there are many different ways to break that but here's one you simply add a different vector to each one of the words one to the first one to the second to the third and to the fourth they're all different and their entries can be sign of something or e to the something it's something sequential and when you add this then the words are different so then you get different embeddings for sentences if you change the order of the words the next step is the big one now we're going to look at the transformer blocks this is where the thinking really happens and there are only three layers here but you can imagine that there can be many many just like in a neural network these are the layers of the neural network but now they just don't just have feet forward blocks they have something called an attention block now there's another video and a post on attention that are linked in the comments but here I'm going to give you an idea of how attention works. Attention helps us with things like the bank of the river and money in the bank. See the word bank here is ambiguous because it could mean the little bit of land at the side of the river or it could be the institution that holds money. And the way to tell is given the context. So the word river here tells us about bank and the word money here tells us about bank. Now I like to imagine attention like gravity. Imagine you have the earth and the moon and some planets and uh, let's only think about about the earth so the earth gets pulled by the moon because it's very close but it doesn't really get pulled by the other planets because they're far away so it moves a little toward the moon and very very little towards the other two planets imagine if gravity happened with words so you have the word money close to bank and the words in and there are pretty far so let's say the bank gets pulled towards money and it doesn't really get pulled towards in or there just gets pulled toward money so it gravitates now you have your embedding the embedding can be seen as two coordinates the horizontal and the vertical so an embedding can really be seen as putting words in the plane so now let's say that the word bank is somewhere here and on the top right there's a bunch of words that are financial and then the bottom left there's a bunch of words that refer to nature and we're not going to use the embedding vector or the coordinates of the word bank but we're going to change them a little bit so for the sentence money in the bank we're going to take bank and gravitate it towards the word money and that new word that new embedding of the word bank in red is the one we're going to use for the sentence and that one means a little bit more financial because it's closer to the financial words and for the sentence the bank of the river we're going to gravitate the word bank towards the word river and now we have a new coordinates the bank that is green is the new coordinates of the word bank and that's the one we're going to use for that different sentence the second sentence and that one is closer to the words that refer to nature so basically what attention does is it takes the word bank where the embedding doesn't really know which bank it's talking about and it says now you are talking about this bank the institution because i pulled it closer to the word money now in transformers there's something called multi-headed attention and multi-headed attention is simply imagine doing this but with several different embeddings you take your original embedding transform it in many ways by stretching it by rotating it and then you do attention in all of those and then you get much more information so now we are ready for the feed forward one. and the feed forward one is really the neural network that we used to know from before it's just very big so in reality what happens is that you have a lot of transformer blocks each one has an attention step and a feed forward so a new few layers of the neural network and then that goes to a new layer of attention feed forward and a new one and a new one and you can have many of these layers and so if before you had a neural network where you input something and get the next word this neural network looked like this it has a bunch of layers and the hello how are words become numbers that get processed in each layer until the answer gets out from the last layer well what happens to transformer is that in between these layers you throw in attention layers 
And so that is the main part of the architecture of transformers. That's the motor of the car. And finally, we have the softmax. So the softmax is a sort of post-processing step that helps us not get the same answer all the time. See, a transformer wouldn't be good if any time you give it a question, it answers the exact same thing. You want some probabilities there. You want it to get a slightly different answer every time. And so the softmax steps does exactly that because the transformer returns a bunch of scores for all the words. The softmax turns those scores into probabilities. So it gives us a probability for each one of the words, the existing words. And the higher the probability, the more likely that the word is the best word for coming next after these previous words that we input into the transformer. So for example, here, let's say the word in has a probability of 0 0.2, the word there has a probability of 0 0.3, and the word once has a probability of 0 0.5. So what you do is you sample out of these probabilities. So you take the word once with probability one half and the word there probability 0.3 and the word in probability 0.2. And then you're gonna get a pretty good word with a high probability, but you're not always gonna get the same word. And that's pretty much how transformers are trained. Now, let me tell you a little more about post training because transformers don't just work like that. For example, let's say that you tell a transformer to write a story. Now here's the thing, transformers are trained on the data of the internet. Now the internet is not exactly a repository of questions and answers. The internet's just a big place where everything happens. And so for example, there's a lot of pages where there's for example an exam and there's a bunch of questions following other questions. So it could have been that the computer sees write a story and the next sentence it comes up with is write a poem or write an essay. And it's not answering your question, it's just simply asking a question that is similar because that's what the internet does. A lot of the internet is just series of questions. So what do you do here? Well, you post train it. So after you train the transformer and all the data of the internet, you give it specific curated data sets that are full of questions and answers. And then the transformer starts learning that when it sees a question, it's supposed to give an answer and not just another question or something completely unrelated. Now, what else happens? For example, let's say you start talking to transformer. So you say, who was the first person to win two Nobel prizes? And it knows how to answer it because it's been trained on questions and answers. So it says Mary Curie. And then you say, oh, okay, cool. And then transformer goes up, yep. And then you ask, and where was she from? The transformer has no idea who you're talking about because it doesn't know that when you're talking about she, you're referring to Mary Curie. It has no idea, has no memory of the conversation because it's not supposed to. It's just simply a question answer thing. So what do you do here? Well, now you post train it on huge data sets of chats and conversations. So the transformer starts catching on that it's supposed to start following a conversation and remembering things. So in particular, if you have a chatbot, if you train a transformer model to be a chatbot and you work at a, any company or organization where you actually want it to answer specific questions, you can post train it on specialized data and then you get a specialized chatbot. So as you can see, the architecture is one thing, but the post training is really where you can get these transformers to do really special things. And a lot of energy goes into post training a transformer to be able to perform really well at certain tasks. And that's it. I hope you enjoyed transformer models and please be sure to check other videos and posts of LLM University here at Cohere.